Good morning and welcome to the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. I'm Alan Sherman, Professor of Computer Science at UMBC and Director of the Lab. Today, it's our pleasure to have uh, Josh Benelo from Microsoft talking about his recent work on uh, Election Guard, a suite of uh, software that can serve as an overlay to provide uh, high integrity results to election systems. Interestingly, this system is, is being used in uh, College Park, Maryland City um, uh, for their upcoming election uh, next month. Um, as usual, we will be recording this talk and posting it on the CDL website. So thank you so much, Josh, for joining us. Thank, thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, you know, we, we've uh, worked together for, for decades now on uh, uh, similar technologies. So I will be talking about Election Guard. I'm going to start off talking about the technology broadly. Um, and you know, if if I think you and some others may know many many of these things, feel free to sort of rush me through things or or ask questions. I am very happy to be interrupted, um, and uh, we'll uh, you know. Be able to be dynamic and you know go where where the group wants to. Um, okay, but let me um, start off giving a little bit of a, a sense of where we are and why you know why this is so important now. Um, just make sure my slides are moving. You can see them. Um, okay, I'll assume so. Um, we have a crisis of confidence today in in U.S. elections. Um, Especially in the US, um, we have millions of Americans who simply do not have confidence in the results of US elections. And it's not just the US. Um, I was in Brazil a few weeks ago. There, there are very similar circumstances there. And many other parts of the world, we have um, voters who are you know, maybe you know, have legitimate concerns, maybe not. Um, but um, their confidence in, in the results are just not there. And regardless of how you feel about these various elections and their, their accuracy and integrity, um, there are some, some clear um, and uh, undeniable facts that we should uh, admit. And the principal one there is that we are really doing a very poor job of giving voters any substantive evidence about the correctness of the, the tallies. When we have good elections, there are safeguards, there are processes, there are observers, there are you know, audits, there are many processes in place. But from the point of view of the individual voter, um, it really is a, a trust me situation. We're just asking voters to trust that things have been done right. Because from the voters' point of view, they've shown up, they've voted, they've gone home, and they've waited, and they are told the results. And the sad truth is that from the point of view of a voter, an election in the US looks pretty much the same as an election in Iran or um, in many, many other places where we know the elections uh, are not to be trusted. But we're giving voters here the same evidence that, that are, that's given there in Russia and many other places. And, and around the question was asked years ago, I, have, I, I should have put a slide in for, for this, uh, where, where is my vote? Um, and that was a valid question in Iran in an election that was widely regarded as being stolen. But that question can be asked here. Voters just don't have any direct evidence that their votes are being accurately counted. Um, just about five years ago, excuse me, I did bring some water. About five years ago, um, the National Academies published a study um, on voting in the US. And there were many, many uh, findings and recommendations. <laughs> um, the electoral system in the US is actually quite a mess. If you were to design a system to be as difficult and vulnerable as possible, um, you probably wouldn't succeed as well as what we have in the US today. 
there is no such thing, thing as a, a national election in the US. What we have when we have a presidential election or a congressional election is over 8,000 concurrent local elections run at local levels, um, usually at the county level, um, sometimes even the township level. Uh, Maryland is one of only two states that uh, are relatively centralized and run things um, as at a statewide level, although there is a lot of um, you know, local involvement. Georgia is the other state that um, that is principally managed at the statewide level. Most other states do it at the county level. Um, we have an election equipment market that is just broken. Um, because of the many different jurisdictions and the many different rules and, and uh, motivations and incentives, um, the election equipment vendors basically spend their time customizing um, to you know, uh, different small jurisdictions and, and you know, selling around. They don't have um, the opportunity, they don't have the incentive to invest in in, in improving the technology in, in very substantial ways. Um, and and it's, you know, it's a difficult situation. We also have a certification process, which is broken. Um, basically, the model is you take your uh, election system, you put it through uh, some sort of third party certification, um, costs maybe half a million dollars to go through and check all the boxes. And it comes out and says, okay, this is a certified system. You can use it now. Well, we know that security doesn't work that way. Um, security is dynamic. You have to be able to patch and update. Uh, we discover new things all the time. And we actually are putting um, our, our um, election officials in a terrible situation often because they may have a certified system a vulnerability has been discovered, a patch has been issued, and the uh, election official is given a choice now of, I can either leave my certified system alone and leave the vulnerability in, or I can patch the vulnerability and that will change the system and take it out of certification. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's a mess. Uh, um, and it's also very much underfunded. Um, since it's usually at the county level, um, the county coffers that pay for elections uh, are torn between paying for elections and paying to fill potholes and other things. There isn't consistent funding um, and it, um, the unpredictability of occasional federal funding that gets dropped in because of you know, some, some issue that comes up um, is, is a, a very difficult way to work things. Um, and we know because of many of these things, the systems we have are very, very vulnerable, um, unfortunately. Um, Alex Holderman at Michigan um, said a few years ago that his undergraduate security class could have changed the results of the 2016 election. Um, at least um, in Michigan, he was involved in the, the recounts there. And some of the things he saw and discovered were, were rather horrific. Now, I have to admit, um, I was involved in sort of goading um, Alex into making this statement. Um, so I'll you know, give the quote now. I'm pretty sure my undergrad computer security class at Michigan could have changed the outcome of the 2016 Michigan election if we wanted to. It, it is that bad. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, you know, there I am at the end, sort of, you know, smiling as, as I, you know, got Alex to, to say that. But there's a downside to this as well, um, to, to even the the option because I this was on C-SPAN, but I didn't get this clip from C-SPAN. The place I got this clip from was a my pillow guy conspiracy video about the, you know, how the elections were stolen. And there are people who have jumped on, aha, you know, you say there are vulnerabilities, you see, you know, the, the elections can't be trusted. Um, so we do have to be aware and have to be careful. Um, sunshine is good and we should you know, raise the issues, 
but we need to be aware that there are people who are going to take advantage of this and you know, try to say, uh, you, you see, you, you shouldn't trust this, this system. And I, I need to be very clear here. In 2016 and 2020, I know of no large scale fraud that took place in either of those elections. I think if there had been, there would be evidence of it. I haven't seen evidence of it. So I don't believe the election results have been changed, but yes, they are vulnerable and we should be aware of that. So what is it that makes things so difficult? Um, the problem is um, secret ballot elections are really hard. They're harder than a lot of things. We know how to bank very effectively online, for instance. We know how to shop very effectively online. What makes it different? And the real challenge is that if you order something online and the wrong thing comes, you know, you get your order jacket, it comes in the wrong size or color, it's obvious. You can see it, you can get it corrected. If your bank account gets double billed, you can see that, you can potentially correct that. With voting, if your vote gets changed at some point, you as a voter will probably never know it. And that is largely because of the secret ballot requirements that we have. And the secret ballot requirements are actually very stringent and very difficult, harder than most privacy. Because for most privacy requirements, um, the, the indiv individuals are allowed to keep secrets, but they're not forced to keep secrets. You can disclose your bank account information if you want to. Um, it's private as long as you choose to keep it private. But with voting, voters should not be able to disclose their actual votes, even if they want to, because if they can, they would be subject to uh, coercion, they could sell their votes, things could happen that we don't want. Now, this is a relatively new thing. Um, about half of all uh, US presidents were elected without the benefit of the secret ballot. And I love this, um, the, this portrait um, from uh, a century and a half ago. This is what elections often look like in the US. Um, but the thing to note is they are public and open. People can see how everybody else voted. That's subjected them to coercion, but at least they know how their votes were counted and they can hear all the votes and they can see all, um, all the voters and they can be sure that the votes are counted accurately, even if they might've been sold or coerced to, to, be vote, to vote in certain ways. The idea of the secret ballot and all the benefits of it um, were, it was a um, technological innovation a century and a half ago. Um, in the late, um, I guess it was mid 1850s that um, it was first used. But this, the idea of voting being <clears throat> in private within a public environment where the privacy is publicly enforced was actually a novel technological advance. Um, and it took a while for it to spread around. Um, it, it got to the US um, around 1890 after a particularly bad um, uh, election. The 1888 presidential election was um, um, massively coerced and it was you know, seen as horrific and the uh, secret ballot pretty much swept through all the states um, around that time. And the 1892 election was actually a rematch between the same candidates with a different outcome with the benefit of the secret ballot. Um, so secret ballots, we really feel are critical to good elections, but in order to achieve them, we have lost a lot of the transparency and, and the assurance of integrity we had before the secret ballot. Um, Current election processes really give voters very little opportunity to do anything other than drop their ballots in a ballot box or mark them electronically or whatever the process is, and then they go home and they hope that everything went well. We would really like to find ways to restore the transparency that we had um, in the age of open ballot elections. And the question is, 
How close can we come? What can technology do for us today that can um, give us some of that transparency? And the answer is we can actually do quite a lot. There exists technology today that enables any tampering, any inaccuracies in tallies to be detected. And when I say detected, I'm not just speaking of detected by um, election officials, but detected by anybody, by candidates, by media, by voters themselves. Anybody can detect if there are inaccuracies in, in the tally. And I'm not limiting this to external tampering. This can include internal tampering by election officials, by equipment vendors, even forms of tampering that have not yet been invented or thought of can be detected by this technology. It's known as end-to-end -end verifiability. So end-to-end -end verifiability really gives us the answer to the question, how is it that I can trust the accuracy of an election when I don't trust any of the components? I don't trust the software, I don't trust the hardware, I don't even trust the people involved in conducting an election. End-to-end -end verifiability gives the capability of, of being confident in the election outcome in such an environment. So the definition of end-to-end -end verifiability has two components. One is that voters can verify that their own selections have been accurately recorded. And the second is that anyone can verify the recorded votes have been correctly tallied. Those two together form end-to-end -end verifiability. And you might note that two seems a little stronger than one because two is anyone can verify and one is only verify, voters verifying their own votes. Um, but that's sort of the most that you can reasonably hope for because I can't really ask you to verify that my vote has been accurately recorded if I'm go going to try to achieve privacy where you don't know what my vote is. Um, but this is you know, very strong and much, much better than what we have today. And it's, it's available and we'll, you know, be seeing more and more of this, I, I hope, I, I believe and I hope. So let's talk about how we can get to that. Um, to begin with, um, I want to sort of present a more modern view of the 1800s open ballot election. If we were doing that today, we would have probably websites where voters can um, have their votes posted in a public fashion, and then anybody can see how everybody voted, can see that their votes are accurately recorded, and can see that all of the, the votes have been accurately counted. So it's easy to achieve uh, an end-to-end -end verifiable election if we're not worried about privacy. Um, but of course, we want privacy as well. And the question is, can we achieve this um, strong notion of end-to-end -end verifiability um, which we have for an open ballot election, can we achieve that with a secret ballot election? And the trick is basically to add just a thin layer of cryptography. We do something very similar, but instead of posting the actual votes, we post encryptions of the votes. Now, once we have encryptions of votes posted, in order to achieve this strong verifiability, we need to also provide two things. We need to provide a way that each voter, Carol in this instance, can check and see that her vote has been accurately recorded. And we need to do that in a way that doesn't allow Carol to show her vote to anybody else. And we need to provide a way of proving that the set of encrypted ballots really does correspond to the announced tallies. Okay? So those are the two things we need to be able to show. And in order to do this, we have a couple of questions to answer. How is it that voters are going to turn their preferences into encrypted votes? After all, we're not going to ask voters to do calculations, to do encryption in order to vote, but we want to um, still get the votes encrypted. And how is it that voters are convinced that the tally really does match the set of posted encrypted votes. Um, so maybe this is a good time to pause and see just if there are any questions before I start getting into these two 
aspects and then talk about um, where things are today. And feel free to interrupt during as well, but any questions at this point? Going once, going twice. Okay, um, so I'm going to answer question two first, both for pedagogical reasons and because historically, um, this is what, what came first in our understanding of this technology. This is the more mathematical, um, hardcore um, process. And by the way, there are multiple ways of achieving these things, um, but I'm, I'm going to talk principally about one way that, that I like very much. And in order to do that, I just want to give a, a representation of what a valid vote might look like electronically. Um, and we might have a, a ballot which is split into various contests, and this would just be a ballot that um, indicates that a voter made the second selection on the first contest and the first selection on the second contest and chose not to vote on the third contest. Okay, simple enough. Now, once we have ballots in this form, tallying an election is nothing more than addition. We're just adding up the columns to figure out how many votes um, each of the options got. You know, in this case, it looks like um, in the first contest, the second and the third uh, options tied with two, and then the second contest, um, the first option won, et cetera. Um, but you can um, you know, do this you know, yourself quite easily. Now, this election is easy to tally, but what if the ballots are encrypted? How can we go from an encrypted tally to um, an actual um, uh, encrypted ballots, encrypted individual votes to um, an, an unencrypted tally? Um, and the thing, the, the trick that I like to, to talk about, um, and it's not the only way to do it, but most um, approaches use this in some way, is to notice that traditionally, Encryption is a static thing, right? What do you do with encrypted data? Well, I might take this encrypted data, I might store it someplace, I might retrieve it later and decrypt it. I might encrypt it and send it over a wire to somebody else and that person at the other end decrypts it. But the thing that has been encrypted doesn't change. It's static. This is an encrypted block of data. It's going to move around and stay encrypted in the same way. But there are forms of encryption which allows <laughs> computation to be formed on the encrypted data in, in the encrypted form without actually doing a decryption to produce meaningful results. Um, and you know, this is an interesting capability. Um, it's known as homomorphic encryption. It has been around for um, nearly four decades now in some form or another. Um, and it's a very powerful tool that's becoming more and more interesting to people for other reasons. So um, homomorphic encryption um, in, in its simplest form allows us to do something like if we take an encryption of little a and an encryption of little b, we may be, may be able to multiply the two encryptions to get an encryption of, of the product. Sorry, I just got a little bit of a cough um, like last night. Hopefully it won't last long. Not COVID, I've already tested negative. Um, the, the issue here is that we're doing elections, we wanna do addition. So what we'd really like is to construct a function such that if we have an encryption of little a and an encryption of little b, we can do something to the encryptions in this case still multiply the encryptions, but have the result be an encryption of the sum. And if we can do that, we can start doing interesting things. And I'll sort of break to mention here that this is a simple form of homomorphic encryption that I say, as I say, has existed for decades, where you can do one operation. Um, there is something much newer, about 15 years old, called fully homomorphic encryption, where you can do multiple operations. It's much more powerful, but it's also way, way less efficient. So there are interesting trade-offs there. 
I'm not talking about the inefficient fully homomorphic. I just need to do one operation and um, and yes, as as uh, I see rest has this is known as additively homomorphic and I will actually get to that in a second. So this is what we need in elections, right? If we take the encryption of a bunch of votes and compose them in some way so that we get an encryption of the sum, then we're we're doing something interesting that may be useful here. So let's talk about RSA briefly because homomorphic encryption has existed since the earliest days of public key cryptography. RSA looks basically like you know, take your message and raise it to a power. I'm leaving off the mod end. We don't really need that here. So if we take two RSA encrypted messages and multiply them together, a little bit of high school algebra says what we get is an encryption of the product right away. And this was noticed immediately as, as soon as RSA was done, people started looking at this and said, oh, this is interesting. I wonder if there's any use. We can have this multiplicatively homomorphic encryption. Um, but it turns out that if your only operation is multiplication, there's not a lot of interesting computation that you can do. So people looked at this and said, mm, okay, that's interesting. Played with it a little bit, nothing really came of it. It turns out though, that other forms of encryption might put the message in an exponent. And if you do that, then when you multiply two encryptions, again, because of high school algebra, you will get an encryption of the sum. And this will give you an additively homomorphic uh, encryption function. And this is exactly what we need for elections. So we also need one other thing. We need our encryptions to be randomized because you don't want it to be the case that two different voters who vote the same way get their votes encrypted to be identical encryptions because then the encryption isn't serving much value. It's pretty much obvious that, oh, well, it's encrypted, but it's the same as mine, so I know what it is. So identical ballots should never have identical encryptions. So what you would like is something where you have a raw, val raw ballot, you add a random value to get the encrypted ballot. And if you change the random value, it changes the encryption. Okay, so let's look at some possibilities for homomorphic encryption. As I mentioned, RSA back to 1976, um, is, that's no, 1978, sorry, Diffie-Hellman was 76, um, has this multiplicative property. Um, Elgamal, which came a few years later, also has a, a multiplicative property. Around the same time, the goldwasser macaulay um, encryption function came about. Um, it encrypted individual bits, and it had an XOR property, that if you multiply two encryptions, you got an XOR of the bits. The encryption of the XOR. Uh, I was working on elections at the time, and I needed something that was additively homomorphic, so I generalized the goldwasser macaulay function to something that gave addition mod n instead of addition mod 2, um, and um, used that. Um, this was actually the first application of homomorphic encryption. Um, I think I was even the first to use the term, although I don't want to take much credit for it because um, it really due to a paper by uh, Riveste Edelman and Dutuzos earlier um, on privacy homomorphisms. Um, that's where the term really comes from. Um, my, my function had a lot of advantages. It was you know, very small and simple, very efficient, even more efficient than uh, El Gamal. Um, but um, it had a, a, a nuisance problem that decryption was rather cumbersome. And that's okay in the context of elections because you're doing a lot of encryption and then you're just doing one big decryption at the end. So it was okay that decryption was cumbersome, but that doesn't work well for a lot of applications. So uh, about a decade later, uh, Pascal Paillet uh, generalized my function in a way that is a little bit more cumbersome to encrypt, but decryption is a lot uh, simpler so, and it has some, some benefits. Um, I'll, I'll get to the why we need to decrypt. We need to decrypt the tallies. So um, um, let's talk about what it is that we actually use for 
elections today in almost all circumstances. It's El Gamal. Um, even though we want an additively homomorphic encryption function, we use El Gamal. Um, and uh, I, see, I, I see what the question is. I'll, I'll get to it. Yes, you, we, we don't actually have to do the decryption. We do have to do a proof that a decrypted value is correct. Yes. Um, so you might look at this and say, uh, El Gamal, wait a minute, that's multiplicatively homomorphic. That's not what we need here. Um, but there's a trick. And I really wish I'd thought of this trick decades ago. I would have saved myself a lot of work. But, um, but there's a very simple trick that turns a multiplicative homomorphism into an additive homomorphism. And that's simply that if you want to encrypt message little m, um, all you do is first take it and put it in the exponent of some fixed base. And you encrypt the exponentiated value. And now, if you have a multiplicatively homomorphic function, when you multiply together those encrypted values, you get something where the actual things that you started with, the, the, the actual messages, are in the exponent and therefore they get added. Now, you might look and say, oh yes, but recovering M1 plus M2, recovering this sum, um, requires computing a discrete log, and that's supposed to be hard. El Gamal is based on the difficulty of doing this. But if we're just adding zeros and ones and adding hundreds or thousands or even millions of those, um, the plain text space is very small, and discrete log on a, a small value is very, very feasible. So this trick allows us to turn multiplicative homomorphisms into additive homomorphisms. Um, so, exponential algamal encryption, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to get it into the recording, into the slides, so that you can go back and look at it. It just looks like um, you have some fixed values, uh, key holder chooses a secret, uh, ge generates a public key very easily from that secret, and the encryption is a pair of values that are formed from um, a message and a random value. Um, chosen um, for, for each encryption. So El Gamal works really nicely. It has its randomness built right in, um, and it's got a lot of good properties. Decryption um, just looks like take the pair of values, um, do an exponentiation, divide out what is effectively a mask, and you will get the original um, value that um, has been encrypted. Again, you have to do a discrete logarithm for this exponential form of Elgamal, but these are small discrete logs. Many advantages of Elgamal. First of all, almost all web traffic today is encrypted with Elgamal. So it's nothing extraordinary or unique or exotic. Um, uh, virtually everything in, in HTTPS um, is Elgamal encrypted. Used to be mostly RSA, but because of uh, forward secrecy, it's mostly Elgamal. And actually, it's using techniques which predate RSA. Elgamal is basically just Diffie-Hellman. It's a static form of Diffie-Hellman, the oldest form of public key cryptography that's out there. So it's very well studied, um, uh, very well understood. Um, some other things that that are good about it is that are that it supports threshold encryption, which I'll talk more about in a moment. And there are some very simple zero knowledge proofs that can be formed with Elgamal of, of important properties. And also it's very, very efficient. Um, so if we have Elgamal encryption, um, then what we can do, we have an additive encryp encryption method. What, what we can do is take our encrypted um, ballots, homomorphically combine them to get an encrypted tally, and then decrypt them or show that the, um, this is the correct decryption um, to, to be a, a little bit more specific, but provide the, these decrypted values and give voters an opportunity to see that these are the correct de uh, decryptions. Um, if we were to decrypt everything, it would look like that, but we don't need to decrypt everything. So. You might ask, okay, this is good, but who is it that can do this decryption? Um, we don't want there to be a single entity 
who has this huge power of decrypting everything because that entity could decrypt tallies, but could also decrypt individual votes. So we want to split the capabilities of decryption amongst a set of entities. Um, in US elections, there's often a canvassing board, maybe a five member board that makes decisions like, you know, is this ballot um, legitimate? Should it be counted, included? Um, so um, using something like that, splitting the capabilities amongst the canvassing board um, is a good way to do things. And therefore, we want to you know, split the decryption capabilities. And El Gamal is very, very good at that. All you have to do is say, each entity, um, each key holder generates its own public private key pair. You take the public keys generated and just multiply them together to get an election key. And all the votes are encrypted to that key. And then to do decryption, each um, of these uh, key holders separately applies its private key to get a partial decryption and the partial decryptions are multiplied together to get a full decryption. Um, so it's actually a very, very clean and simple approach to doing this split key um, uh, formulation. And we can even take it a step further and do thresholding. So with thresholding, we can say it doesn't even require all the key holders to come together. We can set things up so that if there's a <coughs> missing key holder, if we have, say, five key holders, we, we might allow three of them to be enough to do a decryption. And that gives some robustness, um, which is important in the election context. So now, you know, we have this homomorphic tallying. We use the um, key holders or a threshold number of them to decrypt the tally, and we can produce a tally from the encrypted ballots. One final thing we need is that the encryption needs to be verifiable. Um, and to make that verifiable, we need to be able to convince observers that the decryption that we've posted is correct. Um, it's important that this can be done without revealing the keys. And the trick is interactive proofs. I think most people here are probably familiar with interactive proofs, um, zero knowledge proofs. Um, it's a way to you know, achieve this sort of um, process where a prover makes a claim, a challenge is issued, and the prover responds to the challenge and there, therefore shows that the claim is true. Um, what we want, though, in the context of elections is not to have a single prover, but we want a non-interactive zero knowledge proof where there's a prover claim and we hash the claim um, to form a challenge and, and respond to that hash as, a, as though it's a random challenge so that we can build a, uh, a static version of a proof, um, a zero knowledge proof that can just be published along with the data and show, yes, here's a proof that this is the correct decryption of the election data. Okay, so another thing we have to worry about is if you remember our ballot format, um, we might have illegitimate ballots in the midst of our, um, our, our pile of encrypted ballots, right? They're encrypted. What's to say that these are all zeros and ones? Maybe one of the ballots is skewed uh, badly. Um, and there's, you know, instead of one vote for a candidate, there's 101 votes for that candidate. And to make the totals work out, maybe there's negative 100 votes for another candidate, or a 1,000 or a million votes even, hidden in one single ballot. So we need to also use zero knowledge proofs that each ballot is well formed, consists of only zeros and ones and not too many ones. Um, and you know, some contests you're allowed to vote for, multiple um, options, but usually you're only allowed to vote for one. Um, so we need to be able to use zero knowledge proofs to show that the rules are all enforced. And there are zero knowledge proof techniques with El Gamal that are very clean that do this. Uh, Sean Pedersen proofs can be uh, used to prove a, a, an exact decryption that this value is an encryption of zero or one. Um, there's the Kramer-Damgard-Schoenmakers trick that can do disjunctions. 
So if you apply that together with Sean Pedersen, now you can prove that a particular value is an encryption of zero or one without revealing which, which is exactly what we need for most of um, the uh, encrypted ballots. And we talked a little bit about the Fiat Shamir heuristic, which is the, the, um, the hash trick, which allows us to take an interactive proof and make it non-interactive. All these things you know, work together, lots of zero knowledge proofs in order to, to make this whole thing work. Okay, so I've gone through kind of quickly, but I've given a, a sense of how um, we can answer the second of these two questions, how it is that voters are convinced that the tally really does match the encrypted votes. And now we're ready to address question one. And again, I'll pause and see if there are any questions. I've, I've seen some things in the chat. Um, I have not been able to read everything. Um, so if people want to interrupt with, with questions, now would be a good time. Or we can wait till the end. Okay, well, I'll, I'll move on for now. Now, the question one is something that really came about much more recently. Um, the history is that um, after the elections in 2000 in the U.S., the uh, Bush v. Gore um, elections where people suddenly said, hey, there's something wrong here. Um, is there a better way? Um, those of us who had been working in this field sort of meekly put up our hands and said, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got a better approach. And you know, people said, oh, really? Okay, what is it? Um, and we said, well, first voters encrypt their votes, and then they do this, and then they do this, and then they do this. And, you know, people listened and said, first voters encrypt their votes. And how is it that that happens? And, oh, it doesn't matter. You just use your... And basically, we're told, thank you very much. Go away, please. Um, and pretty much all of us who had been working on elections had the simultaneous realization that we had been writing election protocols and completely ignoring voters um, who are kind of important to the process. Um, and we need better ways of bringing voters into the process and getting them to turn their preferences into encrypted votes without having to actually do real work because we can't ask voters to do that. So how is it that humans can encrypt? Well, we can ask them to use their own devices, use your mobile phone or something. Um, but then that device could be given to them by a, a coercer or it could be sold to another party. So they're not going to get you know, the, the privacy that we want them to have, at least the, uh, the protection from coercion and, and vote selling. So we can ask voters, okay, you're not using your own devices to vote, um, but how is it that voters are going to trust that these official devices are encrypting their votes accurately. We need to find a way to engage humans in this interactive proof process um, so that they can be confident that their votes have been accurately encrypted, even though they're not doing the encryptions. If voters were machines, we could just ask them to you know, do the, the encryption on their own, but we can't, so we need other ways. So how is it that humans can verify their votes? Now, at this point, what I'd like to do is I've got a bunch of slides I can use, but um, I've got a trick that I like to do that I think makes the point clearer. I've got a deck of cards here. It's an old ratty deck of cards, but I still use it because I used it five years ago to show Hillary Clinton how this trick works. Um, and I've just been, you know, I'm, I'm unwilling to get rid of it. I'm going to keep on using it. Um, so um, I'd like to recruit somebody who will be willing to sort of turn on a microphone and be a volunteer um, for what I call the world's most boring card trick. I can do that. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so let me show you how this works. I, and I, there's, I have no you know, sleight of hand capabilities here. Basically, there are two kinds of votes. There's a black vote, a vote for black, and this is a vote for black, and this is an encryption of a vote for black. You can't see it unless I reveal it, what it's an encryption of. And you can also vote for red, and here's an encryption of a red vote. 
Okay. Yes, and I am going to be your voting device. If I could cheat you without being detected, I might do that. And you want to be able to ensure that I'm not cheating you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to be a little suspicious here. Um, but would you like to vote for red or for black? Should I tell you? Like, there's yes, no you, you tell me. I'm time. the voting device, so I'm going to, going to know. Okay. So okay. red or black? Okay. Red. Red. Okay. I claim that this is a vote for red. Now you can just accept that and keep it, or you will have an opportunity now to say, "No, you want you want to challenge me, and you want to you want to see what what it really is." And again, yeah. I'm going to encourage you to be a little bit skeptical. So, would you like to keep this vote, or would you like to challenge it? Uh, I want challenge. Okay, you challenge it, and now you can see this really is a vote for red, as I claimed. Okay, now I'm going to take this and just put it aside. And give you a chance to do it again, and you can vote red this again, or you can vote black. You know, you can choose how you want to vote. How would you like to vote this time? Red. Red. Okay. I claim this is a vote for red. Would you like to keep it or challenge it? Challenge. Challenge. Okay. That's a vote for red as well. Put it to the side. Do it again. Red or black? Uh, red. Red. Okay. Here it is. I claim this is red. Do you want to keep it or challenge it? Keep it. Keep it. Okay. You see, I told you it's the world's most boring card trick. People get bored very quickly. Okay. So this is now going to be your vote. Um, you have good reason to believe it's red at this point. Mm -hmm. You could sort of write your name on the back and track it through the system, but you don't know whether it's a heart or a diamond. You don't know what its rank is. And most importantly, you have no way of proving to anybody else what this is, even though you have good reason to, to believe that this matches your selection. True. So this actually becomes your vote. And that's the trick. And now I'll show you, yeah, it really was red. I, know. I didn't want to take a chance on, on cheating and being discovered. So I was honest. So having done that allows me to skip a whole bunch of slides showing how that could be done. And say that this challenge process is not something that everybody has to do. It can be layered on top of spoiling a ballot, which is something that's already um, a, a technique that exists. Um, and even if you know a tiny number of voters um, will spoil a ballot in an, in, in an election. If a hundred voters in, a, in an election of a hundred million people spoil a ballot, then you have accuracy within 1%. You know, it's unlikely that the system would be able to cheat on more than 1% of the votes without being detected. And I'll turn it around and say, if 1% of voters are actually doing challenges, then you're within a hundred votes. You know, trying to steal a hundred votes would probably be detected. So we don't have to have lots and lots of voters doing this. We just have to have voters capable of doing this. And then you know, a small percentage actually spoiling, that is great. That's really all we need. Statistics are our friends here. Okay. So at the end of an election like this, what you'll have is a verifiable record. Um, um, and yeah, there are only a thousand voters in a precinct, perhaps. Um, but we're we're looking, you know, over the course of a whole election. Um, uh, and you know, this doesn't work as well for very small elections. But anyway, um, a verifiable election record um, would look like this: you get at the end a publication, a, a website that has all of the encrypted votes, the encrypted tallies. Um, all of the spoiled votes, provable decryptions, verifiable decryptions of all the, the spoiled, the challenge votes, so that you can check and see that your spoiled ballots are correct. There are also ways of making it that you can in situ check that your um, challenge votes are correct without waiting for this record to, to be published. And of course, a verifiable proof that um, the encrypted ballots correspond to the actual tally. Um, so, what is it? mean to verify one of these records? Well, you have to be able to write a verifier that checks that the uh, encrypted ballots have been 
correctly combined homomorphically to get encrypted tallies, that the encrypted tallies have been correctly decrypted, that the spoiled ballots are correctly decrypted, and that each of the individual ballots, the zero knowledge proofs that they're well formed have been done. This is um, first year programming kind of work. It's a great, like it's a little two week programming project to write a verifier. And the goal is to make it that lots of people can write verifiers. Anybody can do it. Um, and there can be lots of verifiers out there. Okay. So what does it look like from the voters perspective? Um, a verifiable election can look essentially like an election today with one exception, one change that you take your usual voting equipment and you give the voters at the end of their voting process a, a receipt of some sort, a confirmation code. It doesn't show how they voted. It's an encryption of their vote or a hash of the encryption of their vote. And that allows them to check on a website later. Yes, my vote is still there. It hasn't been changed from the time I had an opportunity to verify it. Okay. And this is actual equipment. This is uh, an actual voting device. This is exactly the device that's going to be used in College Park starting next week. The early voting starts next Wednesday, I believe. Um, and um, this is uh, an image of an actual receipt that came out of one of these devices. Okay, so voters can take those receipts, check um, on the website. Oh, yep, my my vote has been properly recorded. It's up there. Or they can do what most voters do is throw their receipts away. Doesn't matter. We don't need every voter to do this. We don't need most voters to do it. We just want some voters to do it. Give voters the capability. Voters can also write their own election verifiers if they want. Will most do it? Of course not. They could download verifiers from other sources. You know, my, my niece just took a programming class and wrote a verifier. I guess I'll download it and try to run it on, on the College Park election, say, or whatever. We can do that. Or they can just believe verifications done by their favorite candidates or political parties or news media or interest groups. Or they can accept the results without question. It's voter choice. I've learned in years of doing this that I cannot get between voters and voting. That'll make them very unhappy. I cannot say, here's this one or two extra things you have to do. Make your selections, then pick a random number, then you do this, then you do that. No, people will get mad. But I can give voters an option to do more. And that's all there is here. Voters who want to can go further and they can go as far as they want. They can write their own verifiers if they really want to, or they can just do you know, a little bit of, uh, of checking. Um, and yeah, the, the answer is yes. And when, if, if a voter does a challenge, then it's just, they, they restart the process and they can vote again. So every voter gets one vote that's cast. Um, uh, um, so they don't lose their vote by challenging. So let's take a look at what this looks like in practice. Um, there's a system developed um, about 15 years ago called Helios, which is available for internet voting. It uses this um, technology. Millions of votes have been cast on Helios. It was used to elect the president of a university in Belgium, um, used by Princeton University students um, and um, other st students. I, I discovered uh, a few weeks ago the University of Sao Paulo uses uh, Helios for their student government elections. Um, uh, and it's also used by many professional societies to run their elections. Um, there's a system called Scantegrity, uh, which Alan was, was involved with and many others um, that was used in Tacoma Park for municipal elections in, for a few years. Very innovative, a lot of creativity, but a lot of work. And after a couple of cycles, um, I, I, as I understand it, the response was, okay, um, you, um, you're going to have to start doing this yourself. We're not going to keep on coming as volunteer academics and, and run your elections for you. Um, there's a system that uses this technology called StarVote um, that a bunch of us did um, for Travis County, Austin, Texas. They really wanted to do it there. We sat down, we did an elaborate design. We we're all very happy about it. And then they ran out of money to actually build it. So it was never actually um, built, but a, you know, a very good design. 
And I'll mention you know, in a few minutes that I have, Election Guard is a Microsoft project. Um, it's not an election system, it's tools that enable verifiability to be built into touchscreen systems, optical scan systems, vote by mail, and can even be used with internet voting, although we don't endorse that or recommend it. Um, basically, we're working with partners um, to uh, integrate um, election guard into the systems and we're working with jurisdictions to say, hey, here are all the benefits of it. Would you like to use it? Like College Park. Um, our first use was about three and a half years ago in a small town in Wisconsin. Um, it uh, got a lot of press, uh, including this you know, little thing from CNET, uh, Microsoft's most important product in 2020, if it works. Yes, it works. It did work and you know, went very well. We expected to have many similar pilots. Um, uh, they were sort of lined up for later that year. The problem was, if you think back to that date, February 18th was like a couple of weeks before everything shut down. And the uh, um, priorities of election officials changed from trying to innovate and, and bring you know, better technology, better verifiability um, to um, their voters to change from that to holding on um, by their fingernails to just have elections at all, trying to find sanitizer and, and uh, change to vote by mail and other things. So we lost a lot of opportunities to um, run pilots then, but we did do a few other things in 2020. We um, were used in Inyo County, California as part of um, the risk limiting audits that were done there to add privacy to the risk limiting audits. We were also used um, in the US House Democratic Caucus, which decided they wanted to run their elections um, remotely, um, but they wanted them to be secret ballot. I didn't realize this until then, but the, uh, I guess we're seeing this more now, to, uh, even today, but um, the, um, the leadership elections in the various parties are fiercely secret ballot. People will promise their vote to, to somebody and then vote actually for somebody else. So um, we built this because we were asked to by um, the House Democratic Caucus. Of course, we offered it to both caucuses and both the House and the Senate, only the House Democratic Caucus used it, but you know, Nancy Pelosi was elected speaker um, within the caucus before the actual public vote um, by this technology. Um, and um, a couple of years ago, we did a partnership with one of the major vendors in the US, Hart, um, to build this into their products. Um, their first use was last November in a small town in Idaho, um, went very well there. And the second use is going to be next week through November 5, I think it is. Um, yes, their, their, election, their big election day is Sunday, not Tuesday. Um, and you know, it's being used there. Um, here's a URL where you can get more information on what's going on there. Um, we've got many other partners. One of them is MITRE, who um, has worked um, to build a really good quality verifier, not just a student verifier. And they've held our feet to the fire and gotten many little bugs out by verifying things from the specification instead of from the code. They've been a very helpful partner. And that's pretty much it. Many people are talking about internet voting. Some jurisdictions are exploring it. Um, there's a big, strong push. And I'll just mention quickly the uh, 2015 U.S. Vote Foundation report, which said basically, if you're going to do internet voting, it really shouldn't use this technology. But although it mitigates many of the problems, it still doesn't solve all of the problems. And we're not quite ready to do this yet. Okay. I've got a bunch of references in here and I'm happy to take questions. So I've seen, again, lots of questions on the chat that I haven't been able to read while talking. So please feel free to unmute and ask any questions you have. I apologize for not leaving a lot of time, but I'm available as long as people would like for questions. Have you done any usability studies for election guard in particular? Um, focusing on the tasks the voter has to perform to compare the printed 
receipt with something displayed on the website? Yes, um, we're working with the Center for Civic Design on, um, on these methods. Um, there are a lot of um, options here. This is a, yeah, it, it's a, it's a difficult challenge because asking voters to compare 256 bit values is not a very friendly task. Um, what I've, the conclusion that I've come to is that that's not the right thing to be doing anyway. Um, although you sort of, in the face of it, it seems like the, the best thing to do. What we really should be doing is giving voters some scannable, like a QR code together with the 256 bits written out, that's fine. Um, and what we did in Fulton, by the way, and we have in other places, is something where you type a few characters from your um, your your actual confirmation code, and it's sort of like a um, an, uh, an email address book, and it'll go into the the list in that place, and you can look and say, oh yeah, the third one down, yeah, that seems to match mine exactly. We're not asking voters to to download the whole list or go and you know type the whole, um, their, their whole confirmation code. But a better way I've, I've come to believe is that it's not that good to tr try to trust the official election site anyway, because they could in theory serve different things to different, um, uh, to, to different IP addresses and you know, not have a legitimate list um, there. The better thing to do is have them publish a digitally signed election record that anybody can download and then have many sites like newspapers, um, uh, parties, others download that and build sites that voters can just take can use and show here's my QR code for voting to my candidate. Um, is my vote there? And it's in their interest to be honest with me. And I can show it to as many of these third party websites as I want and just have them check. So um, it's it's actually a function that I think is better if it's proxied um, to one or more sites that voters choose to trust. The big difference here is that with current elections, voters don't have the choice in who to trust. They have to trust their local election authorities and the equipment vendors that they choose and sort of there's a chain of trust here. What this technology allows is that voters can proxy their trust as they choose. They can choose who to trust and if they want, they don't have to trust anybody else. They could do it all themselves. But I think very few voters would actually do everything themselves. With that suggestion, I presume part of the check of the third party would be to check the correctness of the QR code against the string that was also printed. Oh, yes, yes, you would, you would, um, yes, the third party would be able to read the QR code and OCR the string. Um, that's you know, not necessarily the, the most important part um, because it's really a here is the vote that I, the, here is the encryption of the vote that I cast. Is this on the list? It could be done entirely with a QR code. We don't even need the, the string, but it's good to have. What are the coercion resistant properties of election guard? Um, it's um, fully coercion resistant um, if it's used in a poll site. Um, and, and this, of course, it depends on, since, since we've got only the, the tools that can be used in a, a vulnerable way, but if it's used in situ, then as long as the poll site is set up well so that voters you know, cannot be coerced while they're voting and cannot be uh, given signals while they're voting, um, then, um, if, if it's used in situ, then once the voter has finished voting um, and has chosen um, to cast or challenge um, their, their ballots and they're finished and they've cast a ballot and they walk away with you know, maybe you know, one confirmation and QR code for this is what I voted and maybe one or two others for these are challenges that I made if they want, they want to. 
that cannot be coerced in any way afterwards. The only opportunities for coercion would be during. Let me sharpen my question because you also said that election guard can be used in combination with vote by mail. Yes. So in the context of vote by mail, what are the coercion resistant properties of election guard? Um, it it is just as bad as vote by mail without. Uh, it doesn't help. Um, I live in a fully vote by mail state. Um, I don't like it. Um, I, yeah, I do like it in terms of how voting. It's it's really nice and convenient to vote. It's really nice to vote at my kitchen table when I have time. Not, people love it here. But as far as coercion goes, we know that vote by mail is subject to coercion, and you know, it's a problem here. People don't really recognize it because it's very hard to study. But vote by mail is problematic, and all we're doing is saying, okay, if you're going to vote by mail. You can you know, add this and have it be verifiable, but it's still going to be subject to coercion. Anything else? Yes, I see a hand. Yeah, uh, I, I actually had um, two things. Uh, first is, is actually about your um, the, the question of of checking. Checking the code and and the question of the um, the user, I I do think we we have an issue of basically you know if if you make it uh, fully transparent um, and very easily explainable like there, there's a like how much you defer to the user to the proxy that they trust and and there's a a, a balance to be found because we we are currently working with Alan on on simplifying the part. Where the user checks some things, uh, like we're waiting for the IRB to actually launch the thing. The the protocol is ready, but uh, because there are ways to presumably improve, uh, because it's it's a mess. It's it's a mess, and I've I've done it. I tried running it, and people don't check, and there's no reason to believe that if they checked, uh, the they would accurately check. Like even even you know one bit is a lot already, uh, and and also I I do love that um, I, I'm based in France and we we had a, a company that did, did uh, e-voting, and their system was great because uh, to check if your ballot was counted you would put a thing and it said yes it's in the ballot box, and that's it. Yeah, and there's. No reason to believe it doesn't just always say yes. I would expect it to always say yes. That's that's a lot more reliable. That's easier for them, sure. Um, but there's actually something else which you touched at the beginning of your talk, uh, and you you don't mention in in the uh, systems that I use. You you mentioned Helios. You don't mention Bellinios. Um, I don't mention Bellinios. Um, I. Honestly, I don't understand the benefit of Bolinios. Um, it seems to me that you still have all the same requirements, but you ask voters to do some extra work. Um, you ask voters to do an XOR. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm not uh, trying here to, to defend one or the other. I'm yes. just, uh, are you aware of the uh, study that came out in Real World Crypto this year about that? Um, I'm, I'm aware. Yeah, there there have been some studies that have, have shown that voters do not verify things very well. But not was... that, not that. Actually, a very interesting thing because Berenios was used yeah. on a large scale in French legislative elections, mm -hmm. uh, and it was broken. Uh, and the reason is linked to what you said earlier with the 8,000 jurisdictions of uh, American systems. Here we have the jurisdictions of the French electoral system. Uh, and basically they had a secure system which was provably secure against certain things. Uh, and there's a company which is not actually headed by Cartier or anything, just a completely different company that was like, we're going to use this because it's open source and everything, we're going to use this and sell it to the French state. But the French state were like, you know, we have some requirements that you need to have this option and this option, and, you know, constituencies need to be defined in this way. 
And by just following the rules added by the uh, French electoral guidelines, uh, they actually broke the system in a way that made it unsecure. So they based themselves on the thing for which we have proofs of security and broke those proofs to, tr to try to adapt. So we, we really end up in, in a question of even if we can develop systems that, that could be good, uh, they could be broken down the road for administrative reasons. That, that, that's really interesting. I'd like to learn more about the specifics. Um, the case we face you know, here with, with Election Guard is since we're only building tools, we can prove things about the tools, but they can definitely be used in insecure ways. There's absolutely no question about that. You know, it's, it's very easy. I, and I've you know, talked with people who say, oh, yeah, we really like this. We want to do this. But this, this ballot challenging thing, that's a nuisance. We're not going to do that. Um, or they do it, but they do it in the wrong order. They force. Um, um, exactly. They, they, you know, they, 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 it's, it's critical that at the time that the voter receives a confirmation code, they have not committed to whether it's going to be cast or, or spoiled. And if that's not done in the right order, there's no value in it. Um, so it's easy to misuse these tools and get something that is not verifiable and you know, is kind of pointless. Um, so you know, it, it does have to be evaluated in whatever context it's being used and exactly how it's being used. I'd love to learn more about you know, the uh, Bolinius thing. I'll, uh, I'll check real, RWC and, and see what's yeah, there. I, I, I'm embarrassed I, I don't know the details. I put the, the paper in, in the chat, but I think it, it's a good paper for people like us because it, it actually, like the system was actually tested by the creators during the thing. And it's, it's very hard to keep track of all the aspects that are modified, non-modified, especially when you have your, you know, governmental interests, uh, private interests, uh, some secrecy, some some privacy nightmares. Um, it's it, it's a it's a vector that we don't think enough about, which is the we think about the public. We are increasingly thinking about the public. We think about the crypto behind, and we don't all often think about the deployment issue. I agree. That's absolutely critical. Um, you, we, we, we can't do any meaningful evaluation in a vacuum. This only makes sense, you know, when we you know, involve the, the, the entire situation. Um, I think the, um, the, the term that, you know, I, I think some people like to use, I like to use is we're not just interested in the protocol. We're interested in the ceremony and the ceremony involves where the protocol is used and the people who are actually using it and, and make sure that's part of it. Um, but, but yes, I will um, certainly take a look at um, the RWC uh, paper and yeah, if there's anything else, I'm happy to talk about it more. I just did a cut and copy, so I've got a copy of it from the chat. If I, if I lose the chat, I've still got the reference to the paper. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a quick one. Um, so this, this problem seems super interesting. You mentioned uh, the startling fact early in your presentation where you mentioned that there's basically 8,000 local elections happening in the US every time we do sort of a federal election. So I guess the question I have, which may be related to what you just discussed is, is there any work that's been done in sort of the composability of end-to-end -end verifiable voting systems? That is to say, if I have 8,000 verifiable records is there something i could say about can i run an election where each of those verifiable records act as a voter or is this like not how you would compose these the the, the way to to think about it and the way that i encourage its use is we already have the situation where we are revealing vote tallies not even at the jurisdiction level, usually at the precinct level. Um, and what we want to do is just match whatever structure is being used. We don't want to impose a new structure. So one of these 8,000 jurisdictions, one county, you know, maybe a big one, like Los Angeles County, has thousands of precincts within, and they'll report publicly the results 
for each precinct. And what we would do is think of it as have a verifiable election for each precinct. So we'll you know, report their results and verify the results or make the results verifiable at the precinct level. And there's no reason for us to do any aggregation. And I mean us as anybody working in this field to do any aggregation on top of that, because once you've published the results at a local level, then you know, put them in a spreadsheet and you can aggregate the public votes any way you want. They're all public. You, know, you don't have to do anything with it or prove anything about it. It's now we've got more than 8,000. We've got, you know, probably close to a million separate verified tallies for every precinct in the U.S. And you, you can um, uh, add them up yourself because those are those are no longer secret and we don't have to worry about um, you know, any of, of what's done um, you know, uh, with how to aggregate that. That's all open data. So, okay, I was overthinking it. Thank you. It seems like there's no need for ballot secrecy, basically, for a whole precinct or a whole county. So they can just declare their result publicly, as you point out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we just met, you know, some counties might say, oh, we're not going to reveal you know, um, the precinct level data for this contest. We're going to aggregate it at a higher level. Fine. Well, we'll just verify it that at whatever level they are reporting. If it's not too much trouble, I do have one more question. Please. So rank choice voting is becoming sort of more popular. And the yes. example you gave sort of looks like it works quite well for when kind of basically if I'm voting, I choose one candidate, right? And then you tally those together. How does this look when you're doing rank choice voting? Okay. Well, large thing there. So first of all, the homomorphic tallying that I described does not work well with ranked choice voting, but there are other end to end verifiable approaches that work perfectly well. Um, there's an approach called a mix net, which actually predates uh, homomorphic tallying. It also uses homomorphic encryption, but uses it in a different way. But the approach of a mix net is we take all the encrypted ballots and we shuffle them in a verifiable way and then, you know, basically each of many entities, each of our key holders say, or canvassing board members would do a verifiable shuffle. And at the end, we have now, you know, shuffled encrypted ballots, and then we decrypt those, but there's no need to homomorphically adjust them. So the what, what's opened up, what, what goes into the, the shuffling could be a preference list, and what comes out of the shuffling could be a preference list for each ballot. Um, and then you just you know, apply whatever tools you would use for rank choice. Now that I've said that, I will say, I hate ranked choice voting. I think it's a terrible way to do things and there are much better ways. Approval voting is much better. Um, and I can give a list of reasons why I don't like ranked choice. Pe pe voters don't understand it. They're surprised by it. They, they make lots of errors. It's difficult to actually do the tallying. It's difficult to report. It's difficult to audit. It's, it's full of problems and yeah, it, doesn't really solve things the way that you would like. There's no fair thing to do with a, uh, a, a tableau of ranked choice ballots. Arrow's theorem says that you, you can't really you know, get a, a satisfactory result um, in all cases. And it also skews things towards extremes. Um, you, know, you, you will you know, uh, imagine that there are three candidates and at some point in a ranked choice, if there are more than three candidates, it'll come down to three candidates, um, say left, center, right. Most people given that choice for better or worse will either vote left, center, right, or right, center, left in their order. And because of the way we do ranked choice voting, that means that's going to be the candidate in the center who's going to be the first one eliminated. Um, and you're going to wind up with, you know, you know, the extremes. Even if the center is somebody, if everybody's second choice and everybody would be perfectly happy with that center candidate, you know, um, that's the first one eliminated. So I'm not a fan of ranked choice voting, but yes, it, we can support it, not with homomorphic tallying, but with other verifiable means. Okay, well, consider me educated, Josh. Thank you. I'll take that <laughs> knowledge out in the world with me. 
<laughs> sure. Now that's just my opinion. Other people will, will yeah, do it. I, I, I see ranked choice voting coming about not for good reasons, in my view, mostly because people are unhappy. They think, you know, we've got to do something. There's got to be a better way. And this is sort of available. And sure, that seems like it. You know, let's try that. Um, but if you want to try something different, I'm, I'm much more supportive of approval voting, which is just um, a case where you can, you know, next to each candidate say yes or no. Um, and it's very easy to, to tally and has very good properties. And whoever gets the most yeses wins and you're done. Um, it's, it, it works very well. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, rank choice where, um, I, 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 I watch and you can watch a recording of the Alaska, Alaska and Maine are using rank choice voting right now and Alaska, the last election, they used rank choice voting and you get partial results of just the first round. You know, how many first place votes each candidate got. And that tells you nothing about what's going to happen. And you wait, have to wait till two weeks after the election when every single ballot is in and then they push a button on the machine and it tells you, okay, here's what happens in the second round. Here's what happens in the third round and here's the winner. And you have no information before that. And it's difficult to, to go back and audit it um, in any reliable way. It's, you know, it's a mess. Sorry, I'll get off my high horse now and, uh, um, uh, Happy to answer any other questions if people have time. Range voting uh, offers a more expressive version of approval voting, um, and you, you could always use range voting with a limited range to keep it a little bit more usable. Um, so, uh, yeah, range voting for people who don't know is basically instead of yes or no, you can rank candidates on a scale maybe one to five, and maybe you have you know, multiple candidates with the same scale. It has some benefits. Um, I think it's, you, you, you can basically prove that, um, if, a, for a, from a voter's perspective, if you're given a range of options, it is best for the voter to just go to the extremes and, uh, you know, I can rank every candidate on a scale of one to five. There's no reason to rank any candidate as two, three, or four. I should, uh, but if I'm going to optimize my vote, then I'm going to put a one or a five next to every name and it reduces to approval voting. So I'm not a big fan of range voting either. Um, but, um, yeah, some people like it and it does have some benefits. Um, but I think it's unnecessarily complicated. You wind up saying you might as well do approval voting. Um, okay, well, someone's raising their hand, but I was first. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, the, the thing is, range voting does degenerate to approval voting. Um, yeah. Like, from a theoretical perspective, uh, there's an issue, though, that, you know, people are not rational maximizers. And it and the thing is that if there's basically no difference between a 0 to 100 range voting and a 1 to 7 range voting, there is normally a bit of a difference between like zero one or minus one zero one, like those you reject, those you're neutral, those you're approval. But um, but there's also the thing of if you don't know how people are going to vote and you're not like basically a maximally rational game theoretical agent, there could be some differences. But like theoretically, it goes to those to the same. There, there, there definitely could be, and yeah, you're right. People are are not machines. We're not automata. Um, I soured on range voting um, in a meeting that Alan was actually a part of, although I don't think you were part of this vote. If you remember the the vote comp thing that uh, we did in Portland, I um, organized it. Yeah, many years ago. Yes, I, 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 I know that you you were part, but you were not part of the, the votes where we gave prizes, I believe. And we chose to do that by range voting. And the thing that caused me to sour on this is that there were five of us who were voting and four of us tried to do range voting 
as honestly as we could. It was, okay, this is, you know, here's a five, we had five different levels and, and you know, this, this was a five and this was a four, this was a one, and you know, we, we tried to be, except one person chose to vote strategically and push things off to the sides and change the outcome in a way that, you know, I think it was clear that if all of us had voted our consciences, we would have had different outcomes. But this one person by voting strategically messed up all of us, well, the rest of us trying to, to, you know, to, to put things in the ranges. And, and I realized mm, maybe I don't want to trust that nobody's going to, to out strategize you know, me and just say, fine, just let everybody do that. that that's my own experience of that. But, but yeah. Um, uh, we can talk more about that, Alan, if you want, at some point. Uh, all, all voting systems are subject to strategic voting. Uh, they are. I think approval voting somewhat less so. Um, <laughs> in practice, you can show, although Ron Rivest pointed out to me that this is not true in theory, but in practice, um, with approval voting, um, there's the the strategy is being honest of saying, okay, I'm going to vote, I'm going to put a line someplace, and I'll vote yes for everybody above that line in my view, and no for everybody below that line. Where to put that line is still a strategic thing, but there's there is no benefit to lying about your preferences, um, whereas there can be a benefit to lying about your rankings or or in range voting, lying about, you know, I, I think this person's a four, but because this, um, you know, person is competing with somebody who I think is a five, I'm going to rate this person a one instead, which you might do in range voting. Uh, to address that, there's the, you know, um, majority judgment, which, been, which has been proposed. Yes. And uh, I, I am actually upset at the people who did that. <laughs> uh, because it no, it is. I, I do think that if you're doing range voting, it is probably the best type of range voting out there. It's just that they were doing a lot of advertising for it in France because uh, they're they're French, and they they were pushing for it and say, hey, it resists that, it resists this, it resists strategic voting, and it's like it's the only thing that resists that. And I'm like, no, actually, a small coalition voting strategically can completely wreck it in a way that some other systems can't. Yep. Um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's this thing of like, you're a researcher, you already have done something which on the basis of its own strength is probably better than more or less all alternatives. You don't need to, to say that it also, uh, you know, gives you a coffee. It, 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 you're claiming more than it gives you, which reduces every other claim that you do. And I, I, yeah. I, I, I agree completely. I, I, I think intellectual honesty and being and admitting your weaknesses is absolutely critical here. Um, yeah, it might have been just, you know, uh, people getting like not the creators overselling it, but fans or like people close to them. So I don't want to accuse them directly, but there was this thing of enthusiasm. This will solve everything. And no, it won't. Um, I will offer you know, another option for people who are very fond of um, uh, of ranked choice, which is also sometimes called IRV, instant runoff. Um, but it's not really instant runoff. We have many runoff elections in the U.S. and they exist in many, in many parts of the world as well, where you have a big open election and then you have a second round where the top two face each other, um, and it's just that. And um, if we were to do something like true instant runoff, where you take the rankings and you pick the top two, and then you use the rankings to decide between the top two, then I think that would be a much better system. Um, and it actually, that one turns out to be a lot easier to understand because it really does match the runoffs that people are accustomed to. And, how it, how it works, um, and it's a lot easier to count, it's a lot easier to audit, and it has, has far better properties, I think. There, in fact, with, when you talk about ranked choice, there is no one way of taking these set of preference lists and turning them into a winner. 
Um, there is, there's a pretty common way of doing it, but there are some other alternatives. There are lots of choices. Nothing really works ideally. So uh, I, I will sort of posit my sort of true instant runoff choice as the best thing I know how to do with a set of preference lists. Mehdi has a question. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your excellent presentation. It was really enlightening. And uh, also thank you for the uh, library that you're developing with the team that you have. You're using it in our like company system to deliver voting services. And last month we have a, we had a like success, successful election with it for a syndicate in Quebec. So I wonder, my first question is, you said you don't endorse the uh, election guard for online voting. Mm -hmm. uh, so be because in the field, there are a lot of uh, services that without uh, any transparency, so you mean not using it for uh, online voting or not endorsing the online voting in general, because using your tool can help online voting systems. Yeah, so here, here's the situation. It's a really delicate balance. Um, there are some fundamental problems with um, online voting that are not solved by end-to-end -end verifiability. And I'll, I'll go through them quickly. Um, the first is just client malware. Um, if I am using a device um, to, to vote, and you know, even if I'm using a verifiable system, um, the device that I use, you know, a mobile phone, a PC, whatever it is, can show me whatever it wants and change my vote the, the way it wants. Um, and I can only get reasonable verification if I use an independent device as well. Um, now, I might do that and I might you know, check and I might discover a problem and I might fix that. But if I discover a problem, um, I, I have downloaded malware somewhere and my device flipped my vote and I discovered that. Well, then it's, you know, shame on me. Um, you know, I, um, and, and it's important to understand the distinction between that and a problem being discovered voting in situ in person. On, on an official device, because if I discover and I've got evidence there that this device changed my vote, then I have reason to, to call for this entire election to be rerun and canceled because there's clearly cheating going on. But if I'm doing this in an, you know, online and I'm using my device and my device got malware and tried to change my vote, it's tisk tisk, you know, bad, but it's not going to cancel the election. So if 1% of people are checking in person, that's good enough. But if 1% of people are checking in an online election, then, you know, okay, that 1% can check and correct any problems, but the other 99% who had their votes changed still have their votes changed. It, it doesn't do much good. So client malware is problem number one. Problem number two is um, targeted denial of service. Denial of service is sort of a nuisance on the internet today, but it's, you know, it's a nuisance. I, you know, I, I can't order my toaster today because there's a denial of service going, attack going on and I, I can't, whatever. But in voting, if you, you know, target a certain demographic, a certain region um, on election day and make it harder for people to vote, it's no longer just a nuisance, you can change the outcome of an election. And I don't have a solution to that. Um, number three is just the need for a good infrastructure and identification infrastructure or digital infrastructure. Um, it's not good enough to have something that's just used for voting because then I can just sell my credentials or give my credentials to somebody else. You have to have something that's more like an Estonian situation where here are credentials that are used for everything and you know, it's really you know, voters are not going to give them up. Um, and we don't have that in the US. Um, there are other countries that are better at that, but the idea of a digital or any kind of um, identity, a uh, national identity is, is you know, a non-starter in the US. Um, and the fourth problem is you know, shared with all remote voting systems is 
coercion and coercibility. And I, you know, vote XX addresses that. Um, I don't think it's a complete solution, um, but you know, I, I think you know it's a problem that needs to be be dealt with. So those are the problems I see with um, uh, internet voting. Um, if you're if it's a low coercion election, if you're do, doing a student council or something, yeah, people are not likely to attack it. It's okay, but for a real a major public election, I would not encourage it. The situation we have with election guard, the reason we're walking a fine line is everything with election guard is completely open source, MIT license, anybody is free to use it for anything. So we can't stop somebody from using it for internet voting. And in fact, when somebody comes to us and says, hey, I'm building a system, I'd rather they use it correctly than they not use it correctly. So I'll work with them and help them but we don't want to endorse this use. So that's the very fine line that we want. I, you know, uh, I really understand it and I appreciate it, but at the same time, the real world, at least in Canada or in Quebec, is all of the votings are being done uh, online as much as possible. And there are yes. companies that are not providing any open, open source code or any audit data. So yeah, I think yep. maybe because we are on our website, you're saying you're proudly using open source libraries like uh, election guard and now you're saying that you don't endorse it is a bit like there should be a common ground between these two statements yeah, yeah. um hey, bo bo both quebec and ontario are doing lots of online voting um i i i don't know of the, whoever it is in quebec if they're using election guard i don't know about it um there's a, a company um in I think they're based in Alberta called uh, New Vote that's been using it. Is that uh, are, are they running elections in Quebec? No, no, they're, that's an, another company. And the link that I shared is our startup that is using Election Guard to provide. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I see. So I, um, I did a bit of advertisement. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I I didn't see it. Um, okay. What what's the the name of the company? Agoravote.com. I shared in the. Uh, okay, I, I see it now in the yeah. Um, okay, um, I I'm happy to talk to you more. Um, and yeah, it's yeah. I mean, we're not going to you know, to to diss you in public if you do a good job of using Election Guard under the you know, circumstances, but you're not going to get a public endorsement from Microsoft either, um, because um, it's. Basically, if we come out and endorse any internet voting, then we are going to torpedo any opportunity we have to do in person um, and then verifiability. And that's where our focus is. Um, so we really need to be very, very careful about it because, it, you know, that in the US, internet voting is the third rail. And if, if um, Election Guard gets associated with internet voting, then there are a lot of people who are going to just say, well, we're not going to touch that. So we have to be very careful, but I'm happy to talk to you more. I'm happy to help. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I will follow it up. And there's another question I can ask you on the follow up email, but is there a need for any other independent uh, verifier like the, the second one or is it okay? We'd love to have as many as possible written independently and you know, yes, yes. If you uh, if you want to write a verifier, please. Um, we are, you know, willing to you know, host links. You know, here are the verifiers that we know about that people are doing, and and we'll promote them. And so, yes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a, a very invigorating talk. Um, we'll be back um, in about two weeks. Uh, the next talk will be. Um, on risk from Sandia Labs. Great, and and thanks to everyone for all the great questions and for spending all this extra time. Um, I you know I I apologize for you consuming the whole hour without leaving any time for questions. So I'm I'm very happy to have had this had people willing to stay for questions. Okay, thanks everybody. This concludes Thank our. Thanks so much. Thanks all. Have a nice day. Thank you.